All right. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Securing the Bag One on One with Ashley Thomas. I'm so glad that everyone is here tonight. I'm so excited to talk about securing the bag. So not only is Ashley my friend, I am a client of hers. She has gotten my finances in order, like financial boot camp. I kind of call her like the financial goddess, if you can say, because any question that you have, she can answer it. And you know, a lot of times in the community, we don't really talk about finance and we don't have it to where people who look like us are telling us how we should budget our money and what exactly we should do with our money. So I am the creator of Black Women in Clinical Research. And just to throw it out there again, I'm pretty sure you guys have heard it plenty of times, but Black Women in Clinical Research mission is to educate, empower, support, and help Black women thrive in the clinical research industry. I'm going to go ahead and let Ashley introduce herself. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Danielle, and thank y'all so much for coming on tonight. I appreciate y'all showing up. Um, so just a little bit about me. I know that Danielle did um, a little bio on all of the advertising that she did, but um, in my nine to five, I am a relationship manager for 401k plans. So if you work for a company and they offer a 401k plan, um, I'm typically the person on the back end that is making sure that the plan is doing everything in compliance, um, that I'm troubleshooting any issues, if the company missed the payroll file, if you forgot to do a contribution, all of those things, um, that is my job. Uh, on top of that, I have my company, Making Money Matter. Um, I've been doing finances since like 2009, like fresh out of college, doing um, Excel sheets and doing taxes and all those things for my friends. Uh, and I officially started my business in 2017. Uh, so I know that we're going to cover a lot of information, so I just wanted to let you know, if you want to get in contact with me, um, feel free to find me on Instagram and Facebook, so it doesn't because the content isn't new, it's 2020, okay, COVID, all those things happening, um, but you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Making Money Matter, LLC. The best way to get in contact with me is to email me or go to my website and submit a consultation request. It'll send me an email. Uh, my website is makingmoneymatter.org, and my email is makingmoneymatter at gmail.com. So, uh, I know that there were a couple of questions that came up on the board from what Danielle posted, and kind of the format that we're going to follow tonight is I want to try to get through as much of that information as possible. If there are any questions that come up, I told y'all I have your pen and paper ready. Um, you can go ahead and write down your questions. You can put them in the chat. And once you go ahead and open up for questions, I will try to get you as many questions as possible. But if you are in the Black Women in Clinical Research group, you can post all of your questions there, and I'll be happy to address them after the Zoom. Um, but the only thing that I need you to do for this conversation is just to be honest. Um, we're going to cover budgeting and some of the questions that came up. But finances, like Danielle mentioned, is not something that a lot of people talk about. You know, when it comes to families, relationships, uh, money is one of the number one causes of divorce, right? Because people aren't having these conversations. Finances are deeply personal. And so the only thing that I need you to do in this conversation is just to be honest with yourself. Uh, and everything else will come into play as it should. So one of the things that I really wanted to bring up with securing the bag for me is about uh, the emotions and time that goes into managing your money. And I bring that up because oftentimes when I work with clients, right, part of my process is having everyone bring all of their bills to me. Uh, and then what typically happens is people will bring their bills, and will talk about things, and then they stop working. And it's because there's a lot of shame and guilt that people have when it comes to finances, a lot of comparison. I make $100,000 and I don't have any savings. Um, I've had credit card debt for five years and I just can't seem to get from a bundle. Um, I see this person doing the same thing that I'm doing and they have this car, they have this technology, and I'm struggling and I don't have those things. And you really have to own those emotions and let that go. The shame and guilt will stop you from being able to move forward because 
you're so up under that stuff that you cannot look at your finances for what they are. So really anything that's happening with your finances requires a level of honesty and vulnerability that a lot of people aren't. The very first step in getting your finances together is to create a baseline, right? Get everything all out. Pull your credit report, look at your statements, see what bills you're paying, when they're due. Um, you know, a lot of people tend to forget about their tags. Um, maybe there are things that renew once a year, car insurance, whatever it is. You want to make sure that you're getting it all out so that you know exactly where you stand with your finances. Um, so just to give you background about my story, right, and, and I believe that you have to own your story because a lot of times. I'm sorry, Ashley, let me see if I can. Can everyone mute their phone, please? A lot of times what will happen is that, um, you know, People will try to use your story against you. I don't know if you've had that experience in your life. Uh, but for me, my whole journey started because in 20, 2016, I woke up one day and I was like, geez, like I, all I have is these minimum payments. I'm not traveling. I'm not going anywhere. I don't have anything to show for it. Like, what is going on with my money? I'm making decent money. Uh, and so I decided to total up my credit card debt. And... My grand number was like $27,000 in some change. And I was like, well, how, how did that, 27000 Like, are we sure that's all my money? Like, <laughs> this doesn't belong to another Ashley. And so I, I made the decision, the intentional decision, that I was not going to do that again. I was not going to go through that. I was not going to suffer through that. And so I started working like crazy. Um, at the time, I was at E-Trade. I was doing operations, and my schedule started at 7 a.m. I worked from 7 to 9 p.m., Monday to Thursday. I worked probably until about 7 p.m. on Friday. Any time that there was overtime on the weekend, I was there. They said 8 to 2, 1 to 9. It didn't matter. I was there Saturday and Sunday, and then back on the grind for Monday to Friday. And... I was able to go ahead and pay off my credit card debt by May of the following year. So May 2017, I was out of credit card debt. And for a lot of people, that's like, you did what and how long? But for me, I was tired of being saddled with debt. So I tell people, like, this is a judgment-free zone. There is nothing that you could say to me that's going to make me say, like, so we can't get you out of that. No, anything is possible, right? You have to have the mindset and the honesty within yourself to be able to overcome those things. So. Um, for me, you know, the thing is, is that once you realize that it's going to be hard, you're going to mess up, you're not always going to get it right, and that's okay, it's easier to move forward with your finances. And when we're talking about that, what, what I'm saying is that you need to be budgeting. Budgeting is essential to getting your finances together. Your budget creates a timeline for when you can do the thing. And so a, a lot of times what happens is as you start making more money, right, I deserve to treat myself, I deserve this bag, I deserve this phone, I deserve this trip, all of these things. And you can have all of those things. But your finances are going to tell you that you can't have them all at the same time. And so what a budget does is it tells you how long it's going to take for you to actually do something. So let's say you wanted to get a bag that's $500 um, and maybe you typically have $300 left over every single month after you've paid all your expenses. What a lot of people will do, and I know it, um, they will pawn stuff, they will decide not to pay bills, um, they will ask for a payment arrangement or an extension, and then go ahead and get that bag for $500, right? But then, like, what happens? You're still going to need gas, you're still going to need groceries, there might be something that pops up that you might need $100 for or $200 for, and now you're looking at this bag like, I could have just waited, right? But when you budget, what happens is your budget says, well, you have $300 left over every month. Why not take 150 from this month, 150 from the next month? And then, you know, by the time the third month rolls around, you have the $500 and you can go ahead and buy that bag out free and clear, right? A, a misconception that people have about budgeting is that, it's really hard, and a budget means that I can't do anything. That's not what it means. A budget tells you 
how you can safely afford to do things without it taking away from your other financial priorities. And budgeting, despite what you think, is not hard. A budget really is money in versus money out. And guess what? If you don't have enough money, you're in the hole, and it's time to start cutting expenses. And when you have money left over, I don't care if it's $5 or $15, you have money remaining. And that means that there always is room for improvement. There are ways that you can cut down costs. Are you shopping for car insurance? Are you shopping for new cell phone plans? Are you giving up streaming services that you don't use? Um, are you going to the gym? Are you paying for a membership that you don't need? Are there services, subscriptions that you don't use, right? What are ways that you can go ahead and try to minimize your expenses so that you can use your money on what's really important to you? And that, too, comes down to, you know, what are your wants versus your needs, right? It's one thing to say, I need a bag, but you need a Chanel bag? You need a Gucci bag? No. That doesn't mean you have to go to Walmart. It doesn't mean that you have to go to Target and get a bag. Maybe that means that you have to settle for a nice Dooney and Burke, or maybe that means you go to the Michael Kors outlet and find a bag when it's on sale, right? So you have to be able to distinguish what do I need and what are my emotions telling me that I want, right? Because part of that will boil down to some people are emotional eaters, some people are emotional shoppers, and if you don't know these things about yourself, you're constantly falling into traps with your money because you don't know what do when it comes time to spend money, you don't know what your needs are, you don't know what your wants are, and then it gets confusing. You're just doing what you want, you have the money, you're going to treat yourself, and that's fine, but you have to be able to do it in a manner that you're not throwing yourself off course for everything else that's important in your life financially. So I know that um, one of the questions that came up was about W4. And unfortunately, the process for W-4s have changed. Um, if anyone has completed one before, you're probably seeing where it says, like, oh, um, you have zero or one or five allowances. And what those allowances did is every number that you added took away a certain amount that you were paying in taxes. And what it effectively means is that when you're filing your taxes right at the end of the year, if you're typically getting a refund, that means that there's money that you could be bringing home that you're not, that you're loaning out to the government. And there's actually a really good tool. I don't know if you all have ever heard of this, but if you Google IRS withholding calculator, what it's going to do is um, pull up this site on the IRS that allows you to plug in your paycheck. It allows you, if you have a partner, to plug in their information. Um, if you have a second job, you can plug in all of your other jobs. And what it'll do is tell you, hey, based on what your paychecks say right now, you're on track to have a refund or you're on track to owe your taxes. And you can be preventative by updating that information throughout the year. So personally, I use the IRS withholding calculator every single quarter. Um, what I'll do is I'll get my pay stuff, I'll go in, I'll plug in the information, and then I look and see. For me, my goal is to break even. I'm not really concerned about a refund because I have businesses, so I write off expenses. What's most important for me is that I'm bringing home as much money as possible throughout the year. So the IRS withholding calculator is a great way for you to know in advance if you're on track to have a refund or if you're on track to owe money. And if you're on track to owe money, you can go ahead and tell your payroll department to take out an extra $20 or $30 or whatever the amount is um, let's say it says $500 and you have five paychecks remaining towards the end of the year and you have the ability to put an extra $100 towards your taxes, you should go ahead and do that so that you're not owing money to the IRS. Um, and that money is going to be beneficial. You know, maybe you're, you're scheduled to have a refund. You can go ahead and talk to your payroll department about decreasing the amount of money that's coming in taxes so that you're bringing home more money every single pay period. But these are tools that require you to be strategic. Again, the W-4 is about how much money is coming out in taxes, and the IRS withholding calculator is the tool that's going to tell you whether you need to have more money coming out in taxes or less money coming out in taxes. 
I don't know about y'all, but I love having extra money every pay period, but that's because I'm a really strict budgeter, and that's why I have to check every quarter. Um, it's really useful if you're working a lot of overtime, right, because those overtime checks are typically paying more in taxes. You want to make sure that you're using those tools so you know, hey, I need to have more money coming out for my taxes, or I'm okay with how things are right now. That is all strategy and maximizing your dollar. Uh, the other thing that was brought up was 401k. So this is my bread and butter. This is my nine to five. Um, and for me, 401k are essential. You have to be saving for retirement. Um, there are a lot of scary things in the world. And for me, the only thing that really genuinely scares me is retirement. Costs are going up. We don't know what's going to happen with Social Security. Um, a lot of people are concerned about, you know, how they're just going to maintain when you talk about inflation. I mean, I look at how much my rent has increased since I've been living in my apartment, and I'm just like, <laughs> I don't know if I want to keep paying rent. You know, um, those are all things that you have to consider. And so when you're talking about a 401k, this is your opportunity to go ahead and save for retirement. Um, oftentimes, the company will offer a match. This is typically free money that they're giving you to go ahead and start saving for retirement. If your company offers a match, you are leaving money on the table by not participating in the plan. I don't care if that match is 25 cents on the dollar or if it's dollar for dollar. Um, typically what happens in retirement, right, for the last three years, even though it's been really bumpy, I've seen clients 50% returns in their account over the last three years. 40% um, returns, 30% returns just by investing their money. And I know that 401ks can be pretty scary for a lot of folks because you're like, what's happening in here? But the premise behind a 401k is that you have the ability to put money aside right now for retirement. And 401ks are typically funded one of two ways, either with before tax or pre-tax dollars or with Roth dollars or after tax. And so what happens with pre-tax money is that, let's say your paycheck is $1,000 a month, you decide to go ahead and contribute $100 to your 401k. If you decide to do that pre-tax, and we're going to assume that you take 20% in taxes, what happens is you have the $100 going to your 401k before you have your benefits come out, before you pay any taxes, before anything happens, that money goes right into your 401k, and now your taxable income for that pay period is $900. Now, because that money is pre-tax, you've not paid taxes on it. When you draw that money out for retirement, you are responsible for paying the taxes at that time. Okay? So... That's the one thing to keep in mind with pre-tax money. While it saves you from paying all the taxes on your paycheck right now, you're going to have to pay the taxes in the future. There is no way for you to get around the tax. The other option is a Roth. And what a Roth says is that I want my insurance, all of my deductions to come out like normal, and then I want to go ahead and do the contribution to my 401k. So with the example of the $100, again, assuming that your paycheck is $1,000, what's going to happen is you're going to have all of your deductions come out, all of your taxes come out. Let's say that's $200 in taxes because you're paying it at 20%, and then you have that $100 go into your 401k. You're going to walk away with a paycheck of $700 because you pay your normal taxes to $200 and then you have the $100 go into your 401k account. The benefit to a Roth is that that money has already been taxed now. So when you get to retirement and you take that money out, you're not going to pay taxes on that money. Taxes could be at 50% by the time you get to retirement, but because that money has gone in after you've paid your taxes, you don't have to worry about that. So the question that I always get, okay, that's great, but which one should I choose? And this is a really deeply personal question because typically what happens for people that are making more money, there aren't ways for you to get tax breaks. There's no way for you 
to shelter some of your money. So a lot of people will opt to do pre-tax or before-tax money for their 401k when they're making more money because, hey, I don't want to have to pay all of the money um, on taxes when I could go ahead and have some of this just go into my 401k account and avoid some taxes. So a lot of people, when they're making more money, will switch to pre-tax. Oftentimes, people that aren't making as much money will start off with a Roth because, hey, I'm already not bringing in a lot of money. It's really not a major difference. In the example with the paycheck, right, so $1,000 is your take-home, is your gross pay, and you are paying 20% in taxes. If you decided to do that pre-tax, you're going to come home with $720 because your taxable income is $900. Compared to Roth, you're going to come home with $700. That's a $20 difference. So for someone that's not making a lot of money, $20 is something that you can sacrifice knowing that my taxes are going to be paid. But when you're talking about someone that might be grossing a $10,000 paycheck, that's a huge difference in what's going to happen with those taxes if you put the money in the 401k um, pre-tax versus doing it after tax, right? You're still going to get eaten up by those taxes if you decide to do raw. Why not shelter some of that money from taxes by doing pre-tax? But a lot of plans will give you the option that you can go ahead and contribute both pre-tax and raw. And what that does is it gives you income diversification. And what I mean by that is, let's say you're retired, you need to take out $10,000 from your retirement account. And if you take out $10,000, you pay 10% in taxes. And let's say as soon as you get to $10,001, you jump up to 15% in taxes. But you really need $11,000. So if you have both pre-tax and Roth, you can say, you know what? I want to take out 10000 pre-tax, and I want to take out 1000 in Roth. That 1000 is not going to get taxed, and you're still going to pay 10% taxes because you took out what was in that threshold for your taxes, right? So you don't have to do, for most plans, one or the other. You can do a combination of the two. It's a good way to make sure that when you get to retirement, not every single dollar is taxed. So I know we've covered a lot of information. I haven't seen anything pop up in the chat. I don't know if there are any questions that anybody wants to type in before I keep going, um, but I just kind of wanted to give you all a break. I know that's a lot of information. Yeah, I've been checking the chat, Ashley, so I can just I'll okay. tell you if you, you know, I don't want to break your heart. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And for a lot of people, if you're not used to saving, if you're not used to investing, a 401k is a great way to go ahead and get your feet wet with that process, right? Um, a lot of plans will give you the option to start as little as 1%, right? So if you're, again, bringing home um, $1,000 and your 10% would be $100, that 1% is only $10, right? Like, you can afford to sacrifice $10. Um, and so that's one thing that you want to go ahead and consider. Um, if I don't have the ability to save and you have a 401k, why not let your payroll department go ahead Say and what? get there starting to save? Am I going to what? Shop. Shop? Shop where? No, I'm not going to stop. All right. And so one of the big things that came up was about HSAs versus FSAs. Um, again, this is a strategy game, right? Um, so the first thing with this is that your health insurance determines whether you can select an FSA versus an HSA. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, when you select your insurance, you have a deductible, an amount that you can go ahead and you have to pay before your insurance kicks in more of their benefits. So sometimes you might see something that says like, oh, you have um, an HMO, your deductible is $200. And so what that means is that you have to pay $200 out of pocket and maybe your co-insurance is 
90-10. And what that means is that the insurance company is going to cover 90% of the cost after you pay that $200, and then it's on you to pay the 10% difference in whatever those procedures cost. And so what an FSA does is something that you can select with a low deductible plan. $200 is a low deductible. I don't even know if that exists, but I know that high deductible plans are like $1,500 or more. And you want to know what's going to happen in the coming years. So this is really important. I know people are hesitant to go to the doctor, but you want to have these conversations with your doctor. Are there any procedures that I need to have next year? Um, is there anything that, you know, I need to be worried about for next year, any type of surgery, anything that's going to require me to come out of pocket? So that once you know what procedures you need to have, you can select the appropriate insurance. You don't want to be in a position where maybe you're going to select a high deductible plan, but you're trying to get pregnant. That means you're going to have to come out of pocket a lot of money before your co-insurance and all these other things kick in when you could opt for a low deductible plan, knowing that that's going to cover more of the cost. So we know high deductible plans, you can get HSA, the health spending account, health saving account. Um, you might hear it different ways. And with low deductible plans, you can get the FSA, the flexible spending account. Now, some of the big differences is that your HSA has the ability to roll over. With an FSA, you cannot roll that money over. Some employers will give you the option to roll over $500. So let's say um, you decide to put $200, right? You're debating between the FSA, $2,000 you're debating between the FSA and the HSA. Well, let's say you only spend $500 and now you have $1,500 sitting on your FSA. If your employer says that you lose that money, you just lost. $1,500 because you didn't spend it in a year. Compared to an HSA, you can go ahead and roll over that $1,500. And then once your HSA gets to a certain limit, you can go ahead and invest that money. It is an investment vehicle. You have the ability to do a one-time transfer to an IRA. Again, it rolls over with your employer. Um, but the, the greatest thing about these accounts is the things that you can buy with them, right? So let me tell you some of the things that you can get, HSA or FSA. You can get chapstick, you can get sunscreen, condoms, lubricant, um, thermometers, your tampons, your pads, all of those things. Yes, Honey Pot is now um, one of those vendors that you can do. If you wanted to try Flex Cups, you can get Flex Cups. I paid for my Massage Envy membership because I had a prescription for my back issues. And so I was able to go ahead and use my FSA to cover my Massage Envy membership and get me my massage. I've had my mom, she's able to buy a custom-made mattress because of her back issues, no taxes, because she had a prescription, right? These are strategic things that you could be doing with your money to maximize it. And so you want to make sure that you're selecting the appropriate option. If you're not going to the doctor that often, there's no sense in paying for a high deductible plan unless there's a specific doctor that's in network for that plan. You know, like those things will cause variables. But if you're only going to the doctor for your checkups and to make sure that everything's fine, consider looking into a high deductible plan and making sure that you're funding your HSA account so that you have that money. There's no time limit on you using it. So whether it's this year or 20 years down the road, that money's still going to be there. And if you have enough money, you can go ahead and invest it and see that potentially grow to something else. So FSAs, HSAs, whichever option works for you, it's really good to consider, right? I wear glasses. Uh, my glasses prior to finding these online vendors were expensive, several hundreds of dollars. And that's what my HSA would cover for me, like just buying my glasses, things that I'm normally going to have to pay for, my prescriptions, when I go into CVS and get things, right? Like all of that can be covered with your HSA. Why would you have your money come out of your paycheck to pay taxes and then buy this thing when you could have the money go in before you even pay taxes, reduce the taxes that you're paying for this year and not have to pay taxes on this item? And that money is a pre-tax, right? Like it, it makes more sense to do it that way because you're saving money on taxes on both the front end and the back end. 
So they're really good tools. Want to make sure that you are utilizing them if you can. And the great thing about an HSA is that you can adjust the amount that you're saving throughout the year. Um, I believe the limit this year was like a little over $3,500. And so maybe you start off very aggressively. Like right now, I put $124 in every single pay period. If anything changes for me financially, I could drop that down to $10. I could drop it to $60 you have the flexibility to change that. With the FSA, you don't have that flexibility. Another key difference is that your FSA is front-loaded. That means once your year starts, all of the money that you decided to add to your FSA is going to automatically go to that account. So if it's that $2,000 we were talking about, your plan year starts, $2,000 automatically uh, added to your FSA. With your HSA, it happens on a per pay period basis. So if your contribution is $100 every single pay period, by the time you get your fifth check, you're going to have $500 in there. So that's one thing to consider. Are you going to need that money up front, or do you have the time to let that balance grow? So um, another thing that I like to touch on because a lot of times people will be like, well, you know, what, what do I do in terms of investing? Can I start investing? Listen, you can invest if you want to. I think investing is a really great tool. Again, if you're not utilizing your 401k, that's a wonderful option to go ahead and um, add to or a way to grow your money. But you have to understand that you need to be saving first. Saving is one of those things that a lot of people tend to approach like, I'll get to it, right? I'll, I'll eventually start saving. Life never says, all right, I'm going to wait till you got your savings up, and then I'm going to go ahead and throw you this curveball because I know you'll be able to handle it because, you know, I'm going to wait like six pay periods and, and you got your $1,000 saved, and then, you know, I'll come back and visit. No. Life will be like, hold my beer. I'm about to go ahead and take you for a whirlwind. And now your brakes are shot, your tires are messed up, you're trying to figure out how you're going to get groceries and your hours got cut at work, right? Like those are things that really happen. And so you need to make sure that you're saving because your saving is your safety net. There is no one coming to save you. Um, if you have parents that are giving you money, fantastic, but they don't have the responsibility to continue to support you. Everyone has their own financial obligations. And that's why it's important that your finances align with what's important to you. Joe Biden has this quote where he says, um, don't tell me what you value. Show me your budget, and I'll tell you what you value. What you spend your money on is what you value. And savings has got a bill that you are intentionally paying, right? Like, if your money is short, guess what? It's still going to continue to be short, whether you save $5 or $20 or whatnot because you're not making enough money. And so savings needs to be a priority because it's not a matter of if it happens, it's a matter of when it happens. So you wanna make sure that you're prepared. Um, the goal, I know a lot of people listen to Dave Ramsey, I completely agree with him in terms of making sure that you have at least $1,000 saved up. If you've never saved that much money, that's fine. There's nothing to be intimidated about it, right? Set yourself up for success. Know what type of saver you are. If you're one of those people like, I'm going to go ahead and put my $200 in my savings on payday, and then payday has come and gone, and now you're five days into it, and you're like, I need $200. Let me just go ahead and do this transfer. Now. That's only one transfer for the month. I still got five more. I'm going to try again, right? If you're one of those people, you probably should not have your savings connected to your primary checking account. You may want to invest into an online bank, where you're not going to have access to that money. Or maybe you need to invest into a bank that you actually have to go into to withdraw the money. Like, who wants to go to the bank to withdraw money? But that's a part of you being honest with yourself and knowing what works for you. And you have to continue to save. And you have to prioritize that because savings is not anything that, like, is a bad thing. Are you going to turn down having extra money in case an emergency comes up? No. You want it there. You need it to be there, right? And so saving takes time. And that's the part that a lot of people tend to forget. Um, when you're talking about changing your finances, you 
spent your entire life with all of these things that you've learned or not learned keeping you where you are. And when you decide to intentionally change your finances, if you've been spending money like this for the last 40 years, starting a budget and doing it for one month is not going to fix things. You are going to have to do this just like everything else. If you wanted a bigger butt, you want to grow your edges, you want to lose weight, it's going to take time, right? You have to be honest about that. And so it might take you two years. It might take you five years to get the money that you need. But as long as you're honest and realistic and you are continuing to show up for yourself every time you get paid, anytime you have income coming in, guess what? You'll see it. It will happen for you. But you have to have patience, right? I'm finally in a place where I have savings for, like, practically everything. I have a Christmas savings. I was eight, I started Christmas shopping in July, right? And a lot of people think I'm crazy, like, gosh, why are you starting so early? But, like, the reality is I don't have disposable income like that to just go out. I'm not putting it on a credit card because I don't pay credit card interest. We don't do that over here. So I need to put myself in a position where I can go into my account and get the things that I need. If I want to go on a vacation, guess what? I save money every single pay period for a vacation because that is a priority to me. That is not a want. That is a need. That is something that brings me peace in my life. So all budgeting does not have to be bad. It doesn't have to be just bills. You can save for the bag that you want, you can save for the trip that you want, but it requires you to have that discipline, to have that honesty with yourself and to keep showing up. So uh, when you talk about things. Can I, I'm sorry to cut you off. I'm just, you know, for people who, you know. So when you mention credit cards, are you saying that you don't, you don't have credit cards or you just pay it off monthly for your credit card so that you don't, I guess that interest doesn't occur. Correct. Yeah. So I have credit cards. I have like 15 credit cards. They all have separate purposes. Don't just, okay. I'm not the only one with credit cards. So I have credit cards. Um, I don't carry balances on them. They might, I might have money that's charged to them, but I'm paying them off every single month. Again, when I'm talking about using my credit card, when I do my Christmas shopping, I'm definitely using my credit card on Amazon. I don't want to use my debit card. Um, I also want the reward points. So I use my credit card and I go ahead at the end of the month, I tally up, oh, this is what I spent on Amazon for Christmas gifts. It was $200. I take $200 out of my Christmas account and I go ahead and pay it to my credit card. But you want to make sure like you are pretty much loaning it you're paying someone money for them loaning you money. If you don't have the ability to afford it, then you really have to make the decision, can I afford to continue to pay interest? Minimum payments are great, but you're paying interest. And the goal is for you to be using your money to do the things that you want. Not giving somebody else money because you're borrowing their money. No, you could be doing something else, right? Those minimum payments, if, you're, if your payment is like $100, probably about 70-something of that is going towards interest and only 25 is going towards principal. And so you're really not making a dent in that. You want to be in a position where you can make decisions from a place of power and not because you're reacting and responding to because you're an emotional shopper or because you wanted this thing and you didn't need it, right? All of that comes into play. And so it's okay to have credit cards, but again, come back and be honest with yourself. Are you able to keep your credit card in your wallet without spending it on things that aren't necessary? If not, take your credit card out of your wallet. You can go ahead and do your Amazon too. You can do your Hulu. You can do your Netflix or anything like that to go ahead and cover those expenses. And you don't have to have that come from your debit, your debit card. Like If you're very anxious to use a credit card, do it for something small. It doesn't always have to be large things. You can do that for large purchases if you have the money to pay it off or if you're able to take advantage of credit card transfers or things like that. And I think that would be, you know, worth us having another conversation about credit and getting into that and getting more into investing. Um, but you really want to be in a position that you are controlling what's happening to your money and your money is not controlling and that's often what comes up when you're talking about finances. People think that, you know, well, this is causing me an issue. And like I tell people, money is a tool. 
It's only going to do what you tell it to do. If you got paid tomorrow and you had no direct deposit, right, that money is going to sit in your account until you tell it what to do. You could keep getting past due notices. You could keep getting notifications, all of those things. But if you are not saying to your money, this is what you're going to go pay, your money is not going to do anything. And so the situation that you're in financially is a result of you intentionally spending it the way that it shouldn't or you avoiding it and keeping your head in the sand. And you don't have to be like that. You can make the intentional decision that I'm going to get my finances in order, that I'm going to do things differently than people in my family have done, right? We're in the information age. Everything you could possibly want to find is on Google. And if you don't feel like doing that, this is what I do. This is what I'm passionate about. This is what I love, right? This is what we unpack. Why are you making the decisions that you're making? What are you scared of when it comes to money? What fears and things are you holding on to that have been passed down from generation to generation because your parents never talked about it? And I remember when I told my mom about being in credit card debt, and she was like, how did you get in debt like that? Didn't you see me struggling? around here with, you know, everything that was going on with me. I didn't really miss no meal. I had everything that I needed. There was a roof over my head. I got majority of the things that I wanted. That's not a struggle. So how am I supposed to know that that's a struggle, right? You should be able to do the things that you want to with your money. You should not have to be worrying about that if your goal is not to have things that require debt. If you don't want a home, you, you shouldn't have to worry about having debt that's holding debt, right? That means you shouldn't have to worry about credit cards. That means that if you want to buy a cheaper car set, you can get it paid off quickly and not have that debt around you. You have the ability and the right to do that. But that requires you to get the focus that you need to get your finances together. That means that you can't keep saying, I deserve this. I want this. That's fine. You can believe that, but your finances are painting a different picture for you, and you have to be honest about that. Again, you have to own that guilt and that shame that comes up, that comparison, keeping up with the Joneses, keeping up with whoever, because they're not living their life. They're not controlling your finances. That is all on you. And so um, here's an exercise. I don't even know where we're at. Okay, so kind of right on time. Um, here's what I want everyone to do. If you're able to, for a little second, I want you to go ahead and close your eyes. And I want you to imagine that you had two years worth of your living expenses saved up. You have life insurance. You got health insurance. You have your beneficiaries together. And it's time for a major decision to happen in your life. Maybe your job is leaving. Maybe you are thinking about moving across the country. And I want you to remember this feeling. How different would it feel knowing that all those things are in place and you could make the decision that you wanted because it's coming from a place of power and not because you don't have the ability to do it because the money's not there. What does that feel like? That's what securing the bag is about. Securing the bag is about making sure that everything is in place, that I'm making the decisions that I want to, and I'm not doing things as a reaction. And so if you choose to, if you believe in affirmations, I have a couple of affirmations that I want you to repeat. You can do that with your eyes closed. You can open them. The more energy you give it, right, the more it's forced to happen. And so I, I want you to say this out loud in your head. You can scream it out, you can write it out, whatever you want to do. But I want you to truly remember this, right? Securing the bag is about securing yourself and being your best self. And I want you to know that you are capable, all right? You are fearless. 
every decision that has tried to take you out to this point has not, it has not happened. You are still here for a reason. You make strategic decisions, okay? You are able to make decisions that you need to that are going to make your life better, that are going to make your children's life better, that are going to make your family lines better. You have the ability to break any chains that are happening for your finances. You are more than your past. You are more than your triggers. And you are more than your lack. Everything that you need is inside you. And most importantly, you have the ability to secure the bad, period. Um, so I know we covered, <laughs> I know we covered a lot of information, um, but I wanted to address some of the things that came up on the board. I know that there are some questions that came up, so we're going to go ahead and open it up for questions. Danielle, I don't know how you want to handle that. You just want to read off the questions. Um, but I'm definitely, if you all have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. This is what I do. This is what I love. This is what we unpack when you are a client with me. Uh, and so, yeah, let's go ahead and see what questions there are. Okay. So someone asked, what's your email address? It is makingmoneymatter at gmail.com. Okay. And someone asked, Allegra asks, what about if I want to pull money from my 401k and place it into the Roth? Will it be taxed immediately? So what will happen is that um, you definitely want to do this on a year where you don't have a lot of income because that money will go into the Roth, will get a tax form, and any money that you transfer from pre-tax or before-tax money to a Roth, you are responsible for the taxes at your tax rate for that year on that month. Okay, Shanika said, can you give advice on whether or not it is a good idea to move your money to a personal 401k account when you leave a company or should you leave money in the account with the old company? So, I have mixed feelings on that. Like a lot of people will say, go ahead and move your money, right? But there's, there's two things in play that you want to think about. One, are the investments similar? If you're going to find investments that are the same and you're worried about forgetting about that money, it makes sense to go ahead and move it. But I want you to understand that all of the investments have a cost basis, how much you paid for that. And let's say, you bought that investment for $20, Well, now it's worth $100. Anytime it goes above that $20, you're going to make money with that account. The moment you decide to transfer the investment, you are going to have to sell that investment for what it's worth. Let's say it's still worth $100 when you decide to go ahead and transfer. You sell it for $100. Let's say now the market is at $120 for that investment. You're not going to get the same number of shares or investments because they're worth more money now. But you could have had that appreciation happen in your account where you could have made an extra $20. So me personally, I don't have all of my 401ks in one place. I learned that lesson when I had Vanguard. And, like, I got my investments in 2009 when the market was terrible, right, coming back from the rebound. And I should have left it in Vanguard because their investments are pretty cheap. And I probably would have more money than I have right now. But if you're worried about, am I going to keep track of this account? Um, are these, these investments are similar, you know? Go ahead and do the transfer if that's going to give you greater peace, knowing that that money is in one place. But if you're comfortable with maintaining a separate account, it may be worthwhile to look at the cost basis and see how much have I paid and what is this investment going for right now and see if it's really worth it for you to say, I'm willing to risk it and see what happens in the market. Okay. Andrika. Okay. Excellent. 
I've been doing research on 403B. I'm hearing it is not great because you don't have many investment options. So I'm currently looking to switch my 403B into a traditional IRA. Mm -hmm. So is she right? That's okay. There? That's fine? Okay. So is that... Yeah, you can, you can... I was just going to ask, is that right? That, um, that she heard that it's not great to... So I, I think that that's a matter of personal preference. I can't say what's right or wrong for an individual situation. Um, but any time that you put any money in an IRA with a brokerage firm, you're going to have more options than any 401k, 457, 403b. Because what happens is that your plan is partnered with a provider, and there are only certain investments that they can let you have in those retirement accounts because they can't let you be too risky. Because you could sue and be like, all of these investments are super risky. There are more risk than I'm willing to take. And they can't give you options that are strictly slow because you can sue for that. That's why stocks have become more prevalent in retirement accounts because they used to just sit in cash. And people were like, this money sat there for 20, 30 years and didn't make anything. That's why investment options have increased in retirement accounts. But you still cannot buy the same amount of things that you could if you had an account with E-Trade or Charles Schwab, um, or anything like that. So if you want greater flexibility and greater control, a traditional IRA with a brokerage firm is going to give you the best option. If you go with the bank, the only thing that they can do is put it into your um, into cash because they don't typically have that. Okay, Jakia asks, what's the difference between a regular health insurance plan versus a high deductible plan in a HSA? So imagine you are getting your insurance and they give you an option for, I think HMOs are typically cheaper. Let's say the HMO is $50, um, the PPO is like $75, and the deductible on the PPO is $1,500. Your deductible has to be a minimum of $1,500 in order for you to get an HSA. If it is not $1,500 or more, you're not going to be able to select the HSA option. They'll tell you that you can get an FSA. And most of the time, it'll tell you in the title of like FSA only or on your benefits, it'll show you which one you can get. But what you're really looking at is how much do I want to pay out of pocket before my insurance pays more? The more you have to pay out of pocket, you're going to qualify for an HSA. The less you have to pay out of pocket, you're going to have the option for an FSA or flexible spending account. Does that answer the question? Did I leave something out? No, yes, it does. The high deductible plan and an HSA. That was what they were. Yeah, you have to have a high deductible plan in order for you to get the HSA. There's no other option. Okay. So Latasha said that was great information and she may switch to an HSA next year. Um, okay. Now's the time. Talk to your doctors. Figure out if there's anything that you have to pay for and go ahead and do it. And like the great thing about an FSA, if you lose your job, even with an HSA, like, well, with an FSA, if you lose your job, spend the money, okay? Spend the money because they're just going to take it back. You can't take it with you, so spend it on whatever you can, as quickly as you can, and be done with it. Your HSA, you can go ahead and roll up. Don't spend that money if you don't need it. Okay. Rashonda is just saying, making decisions from a place of power. She said that's so good. Mm-hmm. Because oftentimes we just make decisions we're not even thinking about them. We're on autopilot for our lives, right? Like, you know, how much you need to pay for your electricity, for your rent, your mortgage, whatever it is. And, and it's always a reaction, right? Like, you know, these things are coming. Uh, and, and when you do things from a place of power, you realize that you want to be telling your money what to do. You don't want to wake up and see, like, all of this money has come from my account. I've paid all of these bills that I've not paid myself. I've not invested in myself. I've not saved for retirement. Those are power decisions. These are things when you're talking about breaking generational curses that make a difference. 
right? For me, my grandmother, her retirement was sitting in the living room, watching her stories and talking to her sister every day. That's it. That's all my grandmother did in retirement until she passed away. I'm not trying to do that. I don't want that for myself. I want to be able to travel. I want to be able to spend my money how I please. And, like, the way that I'm saving now, I'm on track to be a multimillionaire in retirement. Now, if I can find ways to be a multimillionaire right now, I'm definitely going to pursue those things. But how different does it look when you can have the money that you need for retirement and not worry about what's going to happen, right? Um, A really good exercise for people to do when you have a retirement account is multiply the balance by 3%. That's the safe amount that you can withdraw in order for that money to last you all of your retirement. When you're talking about $100,000, it's only a couple hundred dollars a year. It's not a lot of money. Retirement is so expensive. It costs so much money, and the costs are going up. People are living longer. You have to have that retirement together. You have to be doing something. Oh, I think that's Amazon, y'all. Can't wait. So someone else said, yeah, uh, Jashana, she said, yes, I'm teaching my 10 and 15 year olds about finances now. I did not learn any of that from my mom because no one taught her. Mm-hmm. That's common. That happens all the time, especially within our community. People don't talk about it. People don't talk about finances at all. And we have to break that cycle. There is nothing to be ashamed about for things that you didn't know. Right? You, you have made decisions with the knowledge that you had. If you knew better, you would have did better, but you didn't know. And that's why you have to let go of any shame or guilt that you feel around your finances or anything like that because it's not serving you. All it's going to do is keep you in the dark and prevent you from making changes because you've not owned where you work. You can always improve. So a next statement, student loan debt is a totally different conversation. Latasha said that. Yes, it is. Well, if, yes, it is. I'm about to say if Biden uh, knocks out this, uh, <laughs> but what's that? 30 G's. <laughs> We're gonna have a, a student loan debt party. Mhm. So yeah, student loans are are they're a very tough game. I always recommend if you're able to to get on an income based plan. Um, you know, if your regular payments are too expensive for you, um, because a lot of those plans, if you're paying on them for a certain amount of time, they'll go ahead and forgive your remaining balance. If you're in public forgiveness, go ahead and try to get in there. Um, you know, those are all things like keep in contact with your lenders. Please do not just not look at your accounts and think that it's going to go away. Um, you have to be in contact with them so that you're not messing up your credit. Because when you mess up your credit, you're going to pay more money. You're going to have higher interest rates. You're going to have to put down more money for things that require deposits. You don't want to be in that position. Again, that is a reaction and not a decision from a place of power. So, Jakia asked if you could talk about the different types of life insurance. So I'm not a life insurance expert, but I will tell you the little bit that I do know. So there is term and whole life. Term is where, just what it says, you are buying insurance for a set amount of time. Um, So let's say you're 30 right now. Your plan is to retire when you get to 65. Um, You might look at getting a term policy for 35 years. You are essentially saying that I only want insurance for this time. Regardless of if you do term or whole life, the sooner you get insurance, the cheaper it's going to be for you. And I do see that Allegra made a comment about insurance. So if you have anything to add, please chime in. Uh, But I will say this. This is one thing that I learned last year in doing research for my life insurance is that some companies offer the ability for you to prepay the life insurance. So uh, my agent, She took out a policy for her daughter, and she did it, I think, over 15 years or so. And it's a whole life policy, so her daughter is going to have that policy for her entire life. But it's 
is going to be paid for by the time her daughter gets out of college. She won't have to pay another premium at all. She's paying more money up front right now, but how amazing would it be if you had the ability to afford to get the life insurance for your child and have it covered because you're making those payments over 15 years? That is strategic. That is putting yourself in a position where you're not having to worry about continuing to pay premiums and you're able to go ahead and have that coverage for your child and not worry about it anymore. Whole life is for your entire life, right? Um, some policies build cash that's too, too deep, right? I don't know all that stuff, but whole life you're going to continue to pay those premiums over your entire life. And so it's a little bit more expensive, but you have um, coverage that's going to continue to last. And so if you get it when you're younger, when you're healthy, you don't have to worry about potentially being denied or having to pay more money. So the sooner that you can get life insurance, you want to go ahead and get that. The strategy that I applied for determining the amount uh, for my life insurance, I don't have any kids, I don't have any pets, I'm not married, right? Everything that I have in my account would cover any expenses that I have. So my life insurance is truly a gift to my family. Um, so, you know, I have a policy. I know that my mom would get a certain amount and the other few people that I like in my family would get a certain amount. And that's it. <laughs> yes, that was intentional. It was intentional. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, but, but what it does is, like, I know that I'm going to have insurance and my policy is convertible. I don't make enough money to be paying $3,000 odd dollars every year for insurance, but I do have term and I know after I've paid on my policy for 10 years, I can go ahead and convert it to whole life. At that point, hopefully I'm in a position where I can afford to pay more for life insurance, knowing that it's a whole life policy that will be with me and I'm not worried about my policy expiring in 20 years, right? Because if it expires in 20 years, it's going to be more expensive for me to get life insurance at 54 than it is if I convert my policy to a whole life. So you want to make sure that you're talking to a licensed professional that is going to hear your situation and recommend what's best for you. Ashley? Yeah. Oh, I'm okay. still here. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I, I, I didn't know I was going to, okay. The next person asked, Elisa, she said, will you please speak to what were some possible scenarios that happen when people have reached retirement age thinking that, thinking they have money saved, but the money from retirement plan is gone? That doesn't happen as often as you think. So what happens with a 401k if the money that you put in is not on your company's book, it's not on the 401k company's book, it's in an actual trust for your plan. There is a trust that is established. And you can find out some of that information by talking to HR or getting your summary plan description or your SPD, Sam Paul David. Um, but your money, again, not with the company, not with the 401k company, it is in a trust earmarked to your social. The only time that you're really seeing that happen, and like, again, you're really not seeing it happen because you can sue. That's why they have to have a trust established for the 401k so that that's not happening. You probably saw that before, but that's not the case. Where you'll really lose money in an account is if the risk that you're taking does not match the amount of time that you have for retirement. Um, so one of the things I didn't really get into was investments because that requires a, a, a lengthy conversation in itself to make sure that we're all on the same page. But what you have to understand is that different investments have different risks. And the risk that you should take depends on, one, if you're comfortable with the risk, but two, how far you have until retirement. The more time you have before retirement comes, if you have a loss in your account, it doesn't hurt you as much because you have time to make that money back. This is why 2008 was so disastrous for our market because people were coming up on retirement 
and were 100% invested into stocks. When you are preparing for retirement, you should have about three to five years of income that you expect to take from your account sitting in cash in your 401k. So let's say you have 100,000, it's all in stock. When the market crashed and stocks went down 50%, these people had $50,000 sitting in their account. What happens when you see your account go by half? I need to get this money. Give me my money, I'm gonna put it in cash. Guess what? You can't sell your investments. So when the market rebounded in 2009, or since then where it's up over 200%, 300%, they're not making back that money because their money can't buy the same thing. They sold their investment, so they can't get that money back. But if you have three to five years of your expenses sitting in cash that you slowly built up from your 50s until retirement, when the market crashes, it doesn't matter what the market does because the money that you need to pull out from your account is sitting in cash. Again, that's all strategy. You should be putting your money into safer investments when you're about 10 to 15 years out from retirement so that you're not slowing down your account too fast. You want to take the time to slowly build it up and you're not touching your investments in a down market. That's typically where you're going to see people losing money. You're not really going to see them lose it because the company closed. Again, that money is, is in a trust. Um, you're not really going to see it because they stopped the 401k plan. Again, that money is, a, is in a trust. You have protection as a retirement plan participant. So Anne asks, if you don't have a 401k or IRA, how can someone get started if between jobs or lost your job due to COVID? So if you have income, so I would say start saving. Whenever you get money coming in, whether you decide to save 1%, 10%, whatever it is, go ahead and start saving the money as you get it. That's what's most important, that you have the ability to save the money. If you can open an IRA, right, because you have to have income for that year, um, you can't put in more than what you earn for the year. So if all you've made this year was 10000 um, you know, like, you can only put in up to the limit. If you only make 2000 you can't put in more than 2000 into your IRA because they're looking at your income. But get in the habit of saving. As money comes in, save. You can always do a one-time lump sum contribution to an IRA. You have until the tax deadline, so April 15th of next year, you have until April 15th to make a contribution for the year 2020. When you have money, prioritize saving it. And when you're able to get an IRA started, open it, put the money in there. But I want you to keep in mind that once you put money in an IRA, that money should stay in that account until retirement. Otherwise, you're going to have to pay taxes and you're going to have a penalty, 10%, um, for taking that money out prior to the age 50, 59 and a half. So you want to make sure that if it's going to be retirement, do not touch it. Put it in the IRA. But if you're concerned about that, maybe you'll need the money again because things are not steady with your finances. Just start with saving. Whatever money comes in, save a little bit. Anything that you do will help. So Jakia asks, do you really teach clients in and do hand holding with clients. I was never taught about finances growing up. I would need someone to hold my hand and walk through step by step. So that's what I do. Um, I have I have some people that know how to do some things and they kind of just want a little help. That's fine. I'm here to help you out as much as you need, right? For me, again, I tell my clients, the program only works three ways. You have to trust the process. It's not going to make sense to you. It never makes sense to anyone that doesn't really enjoy money like I do because you don't like money. I enjoy it. I like seeing the process unfold. You have to be honest and you have to keep showing up. So as long as you're willing to keep showing up and you're telling me what you want to learn and what, you, what goals you have, we can achieve that. 
right? But you have to be realistic. It's going to take time. If you don't know about finances, you haven't really, you know, learned a lot or anything like that, just because we work together for a month, it's not going to fix anything, right? This is mindset. This is intentional decision. And so it takes time. But yes, I handhold. I have clients that call me and be like, Ashley, I need you to talk me out of this decision. And I'll be like, sis, that's not on the budget. That was not part of the plan. No, Danielle will tell you. Danielle wanted to take a birthday trip. Mm-hmm. Ashley said, you don't need no birthday trip. I said, I said, what about a little birthday trip, like a little small birthday trip, like a, a small one? And then COVID happened, so I had to sit down anyway. I know, you know, with everything going on, this was probably the best as, as far as my finances went year that I've had as far as knocking out debt and everything. Like I had extra money for food. I had extra money for gas, you know, like. I pretty much had a big bulk of savings when all of this started and it has definitely actually has helped me tremendously. I'm going to be able to pay my car off sooner. And so I guess with me, what I realized is that I was eating a lot of my money. So you don't really realize how much you're spending when, you know, in your head, you're like, okay, I'm just going to go get something to eat but you don't really count how many times you're going out to eat. And so when Ashley really made me look, at my finances and see how much money that I was spending on eating out it I couldn't even I was speechless I, I couldn't even believe that I was spending I think one month I probably spent over a thousand something dollars on just eating out and you don't realize with if you go get coffee or you go get lunch every day or you go get dinner or you tell yourself oh I don't feel like cooking tonight that adds up. That's money that can be spent paying your debt and everything like that. So it definitely, it was those hard conversations, though, that really helped me realize I got some bad spending habits and I need to change this. If I want to knock out my debt and stop feeling like I'm living paycheck to paycheck, because a lot of times people think, oh, I don't have enough. I don't make enough money. And what I came to realize is not that I don't make enough money, it's that I'm not telling my money what to do so that I won't be in any situations where I don't have any money or where I'm like, okay, why is it that my bank account is either going overdrawn or, you know, and, it, you know, taking that hard look and realizing like, I'm spending way too much on food. I need to start cooking. That changed, that changed my life tremendously. So if anyone has any questions, if they want to take their self, I, I, Ashley, how much time do you have? Um, I have like 10 more minutes. Okay. So if anyone wants to ask a question, if they want to um, unmute themselves and ask a question. I, I don't have a it. question, but I just want to agree with you, Danielle, that literally getting coffee, like, because I live in New York City, so I'm constantly buying breakfast. Bacon, egg, and cheese is what we live off of. <laughs> buying breakfast and buying lunch every day at work. I was spending so much money every week. And after I had a child, I was like, plus childcare? No, it's time to cut back. So I put all my numbers in the Excel sheet so I can have a clear picture of what's going on. Because when you have a card, you just you just swipe. Like, you know, money is so you just keep swiping. The other thing I decided to do was if I do decide to swipe and the purchases are, it doesn't even have to be a substantial purchase. I'm going to use my credit card because I know that there's points there. And then I'm just going to transfer that money right back over to pay it off just so I can get the yeah. reward point because it adds up. Even if it's $12 here, $10 here, you can add that directly back to your um, credit card statement or your credit card bill. And it yep. helps. So that is like a few tips that I've learned to do. But yes, mm -hmm. make your own coffee at home. <laughs> right. Cook. <laughs> like cook. <laughs> right. no if you don't know how to cook, find a recipe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. I have another, I have a question. It's Marlene here. Um, <clears throat> so um, it's funny you talked about the IRA. I recently advised I have no IRA financial planning experience, by the way. But mm -hmm. I had told my friend, um, we worked together. We both got laid off in the same company. And I had told her to take her money out from the IRA. 
And when you said, like, if you're not really planning to do anything and if it's not the same uh, to just leave it there, like, now I feel like calling her right now and advising her otherwise. Because I just logged into my, my IRA stuff, and I don't know what she did, but I put aggressive growth, and mine is up. I don't know what she did, mm -hmm. but you're right. It's like, it's chilling. And yeah, I don't know what to tell her now. Like, I think she might have put the paperwork in and stuff. Like, do I like call her tomorrow, tonight, tell her, like, girl, get it back? Or it's a now. <laughs> so I, I would say, like, one, don't, don't beat yourself up about it, right? Like, we all have a responsibility when we get advice from other people, it's on us to go ahead and make a responsibility and say, like, yes, I'm going to do this thing, or no, I'm not going to do that thing. So don't beat yourself up around that, right? Hopefully she did her own research to determine if that's what she wanted to do. But the market has rebounded, right? It was terrible pre-election, and now it has rebounded. So, um, you know, she... If the transfer has not happened, she can go ahead and call to go ahead and cancel it. But that still does not mean that her account is going to perform the same if she doesn't have the same investment. So from what you just told me, aggressive growth means two things. One, aggressive means that you have probably about 90% or more stocks in your account. And two, you're invested in growth um, companies. And so what that means when you hear Dow's growth and blend when it comes to investing, growth means that let's say our economy is at 50% right now. Those growth companies are outperforming our economy. So when the economy is hot and making money, you're going to make a whole lot of money. But when there are downturns, there is a potential for you to lose more money because you're taking more risk. So even if she cancels that transfer, if her investments do not match, or the level of risk that she's taking does not match, she might not see that same performance. That's why it doesn't make sense to beat yourself up about it, because if she has different investments, it's going to perform differently. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Ashley, can you tell everyone how to reach you again, just so they have it one more time? Yeah, sure. So you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Making Money Matter LLC. Um, don't judge me because there's not a lot of new posts for 2020, okay? I'm still, I'm trying to make it through 2020. Um, but if you have any questions, um, you want to contact me, you want to be a client, you can go to my website, makingmoneymatter.org, and you can fill out the consultation request. You can send me an email at makingmoneymatter at gmail.com, makingmoneymatter at gmail.com. I will answer your questions. I do work a nine to five. I have this business. I have another business. So I will try to get to you as soon as possible. I am taking new clients. If you have questions, if you have concerns, I will try to help you to the best of my ability. But at a certain point, sis, you might have to run me my coins is all that I'm saying. So, you know, I will help you as much as I can for free. But a sister does like her coins, okay? I am also trying to secure the bag. Yes, I think it's definitely important. Um, thank you, Ashley, for speaking with everyone tonight and dropping these gems i think is really important to change your relationship with money you know change your thought process of what you have been learned as a child and to really tap in and figure out where is all my money going and just creating that budget i think the most important part for me was creating that budget and seeing where my money was going every paycheck and being able to, you know, that feeling of when you pay something off and you're like excited and, you know, you're like, okay, I want to pay off more. And that just having that feeling and just taking your finances and everything seriously. And then, you know, also once you learn how to do it, teach someone else, let them know, you know, what works for me. I know mm -hmm. Ashley, what she kind of taught me is to pay my bills, like split them up. And that to me was super effective. Like you never really think, okay, well, I'm just going to pay off this whole bill or whatnot. It, it made it to where when I was splitting up my payments that it seemed like I was paying more and that I had a credit. 
So that's, it kind of changed the whole dynamics of my accounts that I had. So definitely, if you have any questions, I hope everyone had their paper and pen. I felt like I needed to have my paper and pen, but you know, I'm, I'm over here trying to, you know, answer questions, but I want to thank everyone for joining. I want to thank Ashley. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to Ashley, myself, Black Women in Clinical Research. Thank you, everyone, and have a great night. Thank y'all. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.